Well, thanks everyone for coming and welcome to the 10th annual Solstice Poetry Reading. We had no idea 10 years ago that this event created by Ed Davis would become one of TLT's most popular annual events. It's such a wonderful way to welcome winter and bring nature and poetry together. It's also a perfect collaboration between TLT and Glen Helen, highlighting the importance of nature and the work we do to protect it. Both of our organizations are supported by members just like you. So if you have a great time tonight, please consider renewing or joining both of our organizations. Thank you so much for attending. I hope you enjoy tonight and I sincerely hope to see you in person next year. Thanks so much and happy solstice. And I think Betty Ross from the Glen has a word for us. Well, I just want to say that it's wonderful to be part of this again. Um, I'm on the education committee for TLT as, as well as on the Glen Helen board. I was always the doorkeeper when we had these in person over at the Vernet Auditorium. So I'm looking forward to having that position next year. So we're hoping that that's going to be happening and see everyone in person. But thank you all for coming. Thanks, Betty. And thank you, Michelle, for helping me kick this off. Wow, I might have created this, but it was Krista McGall's wonderful idea 10 years ago to have this event. And uh, I can't believe it's the 10th already. I was a mere stripling of 60 years, and now my 70th birthday is day after tomorrow. So surely 10 years have passed. And if we were in that wonderful warm room, I'd be asking for a show of hands. You know, how many have been here for all 10 of them? How many of them, how many of you have been here for eight or nine? And I'll bet there are some who have been here for all of them. So welcome, wherever you're coming from. I know there are people in Florida watching. I think there, um, I have a friend in Seattle. So welcome to all of you. We're here in Yellow Springs, Ohio, most of us. Uh, the theme, Sacred Ground, seemed quite appropriate after um, Glen Helen, which is you know, our home for this event, was closed for so long during the pandemic. And now that it's open and under new uh, ownership, you know, we couldn't be happier about that. So we are coming home. This is a homecoming to our sacred ground. But if that theme means something else to you as a poet, you know, we're gonna hear from you tonight what it means to you. Uh, we're celebrating that 10 year anniversary in a couple of special ways. We've got a very special guest coming up very soon. And I wanted to announce, if you don't know already, we're going to have a print anthology that will be available at next year's event of 61 of the 87 poets who have read at this event. 61 of them have agreed to let us use their work in this anthology. They'll be available for sale, for autographing, and we're hoping the, the committee is just going to try to make it as beautiful a publication as we can, so we'd be proud of it. I could thank a lot of people, you know, the education committee that supports me, whose uh, event this is, but especially Melissa Batista and Matt Birdsall, you know, who have taken care of the tech side. We apologize for any glitches that might occur, and we hope that you would just bear with us, and, you know, they mostly work themselves out. Uh, speaking of Matt, he's going to take the helm of this event. You know, 10 years is long enough for me to have been the captain. So let's let Matt come to bat on it. And he's going to be a great host for us next time. Thanks to Riley Dixon for writing a wonderful um, article he did in the Yellow Springs News this week. All right, let's get going. Uh, by the way, we're recording this event. So if you have to leave in the middle or you have friends who wanted to see it and can't be here tonight, uh, it will be posted to TLT's website uh, eventually at some time within the next few days. All right, the evening's format is, we have these 11 readers that will read for no more than five minutes with the exception of our first reader. You know, she only reads every hundred years or so. So, you know, we wanted to give her a little bit more time. We'll keep introductions short because the wonderful bios uh, lengthy bios with uh, headshots posted to TLT's website, you can consult. And um, speaking of uh, writers who have books, those are mentioned. And if you wanna find uh, more information about 
the poets and where they might be published. And also their books will be, um, will have links to them as the poet speaks. All right, and remember that books make great Christmas presents. All right, this year we pulled names out of a hat. So the order of poets, it came about that way. And I'm pleased to bring on the first poet. Through the magic of technology, the alignment of certain planets, plus some darn good luck, we're able to bring you a very special guest tonight. Helen Louise Birch Bartlett is the daughter of Hugh Taylor Birch, who so admired Horace Mann, the first president of Antioch College, that he gifted the college with a thousand acres of pristine forested land and named them for his daughter, Helen. So without further ado, through the mists of time, would you welcome Helen Louise Birch Bartlett. Oh, uh, is this where you want me to be? Is this where we are? Okay, um, let's see, where is everybody? I... Oh my goodness. <gasps> I never in my wildest dreams. <laughs> well, good evening, friends. My name is Helen Louise Birch Bartlett. Many of you are familiar with my father, as Mr. Davis said, Hugh Taylor Birch, who gave this land to Antioch College so many years ago. I reside close to here, under a tree. You, you may not have seen me lately, but you may have heard my song. It goes like this. The earth is old and warm and mellow, and all things lie at peace. I do serenely lie here under the white oak tree, and know the splendid flight of hours, all blue and gay, sun-drenched and still, and know the splendid flight of hours. There is one place I can rest, and it is here. I am so honored to be opening this wonderful evening of poetry, the 10th anniversary, and the last time that my dear friend, Mr. Davis, will be hosting. Oh, bravo, dear Mr. Davis. It is wonderful to be with you, to celebrate the end of autumn and the coming on of winter, to honor this sacred ground on the eve of the solstice. Tonight, I will be reading several poems from my book called Autumn Leaves. Please forgive me if I'm a little rusty. It's been a long time. <clears throat> this first one is called Mid-October. Leaves whirl about my feet. Leaves, leaves dance over my head. Brown leaves and their madness and love of death blow through my heart. Oh, the perfume of these drifting golden leaves. What wine can stain the soul with redder glory than this wild sudden thirst for sudden death? They rise like clouds of incense from swift swinging golden censers, clouds and clouds. And the western sky is a glow of light as yellow and white as the face of a Christian saint. Autumn, autumn, I will not live. I go now, now with all my memories and joy. I will not live to have them blown like ashes from an altar by capricious winds. It's funny how I think so much about death. It's a puzzle. I revel in the natural world. I love poetry, music, and art, all the things that make life worth living, and yet Death, it's a puzzle. This next one is called Up in the Hills. The earth smells old and warm and mellow and all things lie at peace. I too serenely lie here under the white oak tree and know the splendid flight of hours, all blue and gay, sun-drenched and still. The dogs chase rabbits through the hazel brush I hear now close at hand their eager cries, now swift receding into the distance, leaving a trail behind them in the sweet, clear air, shrill bursts of joy. There's something almost 
drowsy in that waning clamor. It brings the stillness nearer and a sense of being bodily at one in the warm old earth, blessedly at one with the fragrant, laughing, sun-baked earth, at one with its sly, delightful, wicked old laughter. Hmm. Well, speaking of laughter, this next poem is titled Laughing in the Moonlight. I must say, I, I surprised myself a little bit with this one. Laughing in the Moonlight. Three women laughing in the moonlight in the night, eerie. Strange, with sound of water thundering up the cliff, with sound that comes from swaying boughs of pine trees, giant pines of a virgin forest, fringe of wilderness, the border of a narrow strip of clearing on the bluffs. Laughing, how their voices carry, fearlessly, such merriment as must awake the sleepy soul of the forest, merriment, so mad, <laughs> how it carries. Elfish laughter far over the wicked waters, peals and peals. And the moonlight wavers, glitters, strokes their white throats with its poison, makes its streaks and streams of silver cold and colder in its joy, sinks its sharp, silver-dappled, shining moon fangs in their eyes. Mm -hmm. Laughing women, mad and merry, send their voices on the wind, calling destiny about them, calling to titanic powers, till their play and their lightness and their madness and their harsh and eerie laughter rouses forces that through eons long have slept, slept, and waited for a summons deep enough, wild enough, light enough, and evil enough to call them forth. Slow they stretch their unused muscles, answer in a dawning smile. Three women are laughing in the moonlight, in the night, and the earth is reeling in light and shadow, air and water in some fearful manner mingle with their voices. All of nature throngs and rushes into the chaotic drift of sound, a world of maddened, unchained souls of wicked, savage glee. Naked earth swings into consciousness, uncovered, sudden, reeling in light and shadow through this hellish, hellish laughter, through this wild, malicious, evil, evil laughter. <laughs> well, uh, my last poem is a message to you, my dear friends of the future. It is called simply, my message. When I go, carry me this message to a few of my friends. Tell them to forget me most of the time, that I'll be far away on some business of my own. But on all clear, windy mornings, tell them I'll be there in the sunlight, flickering around and and sometimes when the water ripples soft against the land and the afternoon is one of those quiet, hazy ones, I'll be nearby, making them think about me then. There is one place I can rest and it is here. There is one place I can rest and it is here. 
There is one place I can rest, and it is Thank you, Helen slash Louise. <laughs> Louise, I must mention, is a retired Antioch faculty member and administrator, an internationally known actor and therapist living here in Yellow Springs. She's also a writer of plays and essays. Uh, please see her bio on the TLT website for her many accomplishments. Thank you, Helen, for joining us. <laughs> Oh, I think my segue will be uh, nature is certainly on our minds and there are some among us who even work in nature. And our next poet is one of those people. Uh, Emily Faubert grew up and still lives in Yellow Springs. She's a naturalist and educator at the Agraria Center for Regenerative Practice right outside town on Date Yellow Springs Road where she leads nature connection programs for children, families and adults. She also proudly serves on the Glen Helen board. So please welcome Emily Faubert. Good evening, everybody. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for being here yourselves. This poem is entitled Tattered. We'll see if I get to a second one in the time frame. And this is for my mom, who spoke with all of life aloud. Go, girl, go. The last text my mom ever sent me. I was running to her house when she sent it. I am running today over sagebrush and tansy, fragrant blue-gray and muted gold, on an otherwise silty claystone taupe mesa. My shoes, having seen hundreds of miles over the past few months, are flapping open-mouthed, ready to eat the dust, desert pebbles, and cactus thorns. I run up the hill, panting in the high air, more so than in the settled and stagnant bottomlands of Ohio, where I run between wet shadows. Here there is sun, light and air, spirit and wind. The sprites of the dry lands tag along at my heels. These shoes are tattered, canvas beneath black fabric. The laces are the only sturdy and smooth bits left. Perhaps poor manufacturing caused them to disintegrate quickly, or maybe miles, the need for solitude pressing on the back of my knees, willing them to bend out of a stony statue paralysis. Perhaps it was the feet themselves starving for movement who first gobbled up steps, footfalls, and yards, lunging forward downstairs, up mountains, down roads at dusk, up roads at dawn, down paths midday, up streets at the witching hour, first running from grief, then running with it. Air and lungs moved the cold sleet that threatened to settle on the top of my diaphragm and frost over my throat. Air and lungs moved the prickly white heat that threatened to provoke muscles to punch walls and burn photographs. These shoes have stomped, hopped, and catapulted off of rocks in grief, witnessed thunderous thuds on earth, inches away, thrown from rageful hands, filled with rocks in grief. These tattered shoes I slipped on for 4 a.m. jogs through quiet towns with all but the robins, singing from hushed red clovered yards. These shoes are taking me up the mesa today in the brilliant sun. Careful, I am on the climb not to step on camouflaged cactus among the crisp grasses. But now on the descent, I turn my body over to gravity and trust my footfalls 
Pitter patter poof, pitter patter poof. Up into the air I leap, hoping to take off into view of downtown Denver. The wind flying past my footfalls calls the other world beckoning. Then, all of a sudden, mom arrives on the wind, medium of our moments together. She is beside me, soaring down the mountain with me, earth and sky, cactus and sand, breath and breeze, how much I longed to have experienced my mom before her hip ailments and aches, to have moved with her unencumbered. I came along in her 40s. Her hips had already pained her. Yet here she is, zigzagging zealously over the sandstone and prickly pears, whooping shouts of joy in my right ear. In my left is the wind. Thank you, shoes. Thank you, cactus. Thank you, wind for a freeing, albeit fleeting, moment with my mom. Yesterday, I purposely pushed for backpacks and tents, full water bottles and food caches, pounds and miles on off-trail hikes, climbing to peaks to find you, find me, find something magical, something to belong to, some purpose in the weighted, weighed down plodding. I wanted to stay awake in solitude with the moon once I got there, the mountaintop, staying awake to pray for you, pray for me, pray for something magical, something to belong to, some purpose in the heavy night. But yesterday, the burdensome backpack brought me to my knees when I tried to hoist it over my shoulders. I cried with Mount Lamborn above me and threw the green pack to the ground showering dusty clay on the distant juniper. Please, no wait, just me and my shoes and the sky. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily, for sharing that with us. Beautiful. And now I'll turn it over to Matt. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, our first two readers. This has already gotten off to a fantastic start, I would argue. Um, next up is Herbert Woodward Martin, um, poet and librettist. He has 11 volumes to his credit, and he has that work on assembling several volumes of recent work. Um, just super, super excited to have you here, Herb. It's all yours. Take it away. Quartet for the Environment. The backyard is crowded with starlings. Some are hungry for worms. Others are rioters beneath the surface of the earth. There are as many reasons as the slaves had names for running away or digging underground, for hiding in places where no hunter ever thought about, nor did he or she ever think looking was possible? The spectral of approaching storms are about unexpected changes, which are a warning for the starlings that occupy backyards and not for the onlookers. Two, place love among the elements. Tie my shoes, sing the blues, distribute the news, arrange the faulty clouds, sing wayward to raindrops, celebrate the hail of sunshine, love the intemperate winds, condole all wild animals, investigate the obscure beings, rejoice in the strong inheritance you have from Adam and Eve. Three, blue, dollops of white clouds in the sky whose eyes are themselves a watery blue container where everything continues to pale down very much like the vast number 
of citizens whose eyes have a similar special blue. Colors are always humbling, like the color that offers an inheritance that becomes wealth for someone who does not think themselves as worthy because they have done their work quietly, which is what we do when we try to preserve the landscape. A time for bees. It was the time for bees, a gathering of pollen, a dance of honey. The background, the backyard was a wild jungle of things attacking and spreading havoc from blossom to blossom. Witness the quiet activity, petal to flower, stem to stone. The sad leavings of love, a rock thrown against the night, a violent interruption of lovemaking, that excellent moment when Tara knocks upon the door and whispers, may I come in? Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Gosh, I was, I was trying to catch my breath after running with Emily and now you've, you've taken my win from me again here, Herb. So who do we got next, Ed? We have, as it turns out, a local legend in our midst, uh, Robert Fashel from Yellow Springs. He's been writing poems most of his life. He sells funny, punny t-shirts on the street in downtown Yellow Springs, one of which reads, I'm a rhyme stoned cowboy. Mm. He'll also gladly recite from memory any poem from a list that he'll hand you. Without further ado, Robert Fashel. Hello, everyone. I'm 73 years old, and this is my first Zoom event. So I guess you can say I'm a baby Zoomer. If you told me that skunk cabbage was such an early bloomer because it generates its own heat, I would have said, no way, impossible. Animals generate their own heat, not plants. Plants don't do that. And I would have been 100% how you say in English, wrong. Despite my protestations to the contrary, that's exactly what Mr. Skunk Cabbage is doing, flying in the face of vegetable protocol, burning starch stored in its capacious rootstock in the presence of oxygen, burning a carbohydrate in the presence of oxygen as if it were a hairy mammal with a beating heart and pumping blood. Only in the spavy case of the skunk cabbage, it made the carbohydrate. Jacking up its internal temperature on the marshy eco pulpit, levitating like a crashed curved nose spacecraft from Yoda's swamp burning a hole in snow cover with its botanical rocket nozzle. A one-man thermogenetic band with a built-in amplifier. The warm air rising from the spade helps broadcast the enticing stinky smell, playing a noisome rise in temperature to the tune of 24 degrees Fahrenheit, luring sow bugs, flies, moth larvae, and carrion beetles to its boggy, odorous tip jar, trading procreation on spring's cold doorstep for a snatch of skanky song. When I was young, they had to dredge me out of the glen like a coelacanth, an ancient primitive fish. 
the cowbell of the moon would ring and I'd come swimming up from a ravine trailing kelp fronds and baby grasshoppers. I'd come trundling home, smeared with sunset jam, draped with dragonfly traceries, anointed with pine sap. I'd climb out of the glen like the first animal venturing on land, having passed pale nodding Indian pipes and braided garlands of waterfall roar. My hair tufted with owl hoots, I'd return to the haunts of men and brush away my footprints with the foxtail of a poem. The forest is a storehouse of wisdom that has grown o'er countless years. Oh, sheath your shears from nature's fertile loam. Through years of thick and thin, each fern and tree in harmony has great knowledge writ within, source of food and shelter for every bird and animal, nigh babbling brooks, these verdant books, this bibliotech botanical. Behold a story intertwined with every branching limb and vine with all that move and breathe, what wondrous tales unfolding from libretto of green leaves, what sagas of hepatica, what narratives of holly, what floribundant glory from the crowns of redwoods and sequoias to the subplots of the canopy's understory. That concludes my presentation. And I would like to thank Succumb to Translust for hosting this event. <laughs> thank you, Robert. And we can all understand why you're a living, <laughs> why, why you're a living legend. Well, Matt, back to you. Yeah, next up we've got Jeff Gundy, whose most recent work, Wind Farm, Landscape with Stories and Towers, is going to be, it just came out from Dos Madres Press, so you'll find that link in the chat. Um, he has eight other volumes of poetry, and in 2014, 20,000, 20, oh gosh, I caught it too, English today, everyone. Um, in 2014, he was the Ohio Poet of the Year, so without further ado, Jeff Gundy. Thank you, Matt, and it's wonderful to be here. Um, I am going to read two pieces. Uh, the first one was written in the Glen during one of those Antioch writing workshops, which are, were highlights of my life. It's just called Meditation in Glen Helen. So I went to the Yellow Spring, cupped the cold water flowing from the red rock and tasted a little chill and metal hard. So the park closes at dusk and I've been so much with people that for a while, I just remember how to be alone. So the summer trees unfold around me, careful, steady, and two guys and a girl peel their jeans and frolic in the pool below. Oh, the water will splash. I have my questions. I will stand together with the others lost and lame when the time comes, cool at the edge of the river, mudding my toes in the brown coarse sand, crying with all the children. What is it I know? How can the iron clean water have so little to say? The forest makes it easy to hide anything, an eyelash, a brown long-limbed spider, the bones of the first man to put a hand into the spring and say cold, say good. Even the last ridge can hold the trees only so high. Some of the paths are closed for reconstruction. Some of the paths are broad and clear. Some days I walk around and around my little town, fussing in the TV haze, stumbling over the brick sidewalks, quietly being swallowed by the grass. Some days I believe that everything can be stomped or outrun. 
Some days only the oldest bridges stand a chance of surviving the floods. Some walnut trees are lonely mothers, last year's crop all swept off by the squirrels who broke the bony sheaths open and chewed themselves fat on the oily, convoluted hearts. Can you all see me okay? I'm not in, I'm not big in the middle of the screen like everybody else has been. Okay. As sounds great. Hear, it sounds I'm, great, Jeff. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to read the last uh, piece from this new wind farm book, which is prose, but they're, they're lyric essays. And this last one has also appeared as a poem I've been disregarding or, I don't know, it, trying to ignore genre for a long time. So, um, yeah, the book is about uh, wind farms and farming and uh, all kinds of other things. Uh, but this last piece is called uh, The Wind Farmer Releases the Wind. And it started when I, I was thinking about these crosses you see along the road um, here and there. And um, it, the line came into my head, there are no crosses on the wind farm. There are no crosses on the wind farm. The turbans with their three blades and the great arcs they make refuse the stasis of upright and cross beam, brook no fixed readings. Bound as they are to their singular place, they are also free. They spin, they make their rounds, they spin. And wind is breath, is spirit in Hebrew, and the blades are tuned and turned to the wind, to the spirit. Nothing men have ever made is so cleverly closely tuned, so capable of drawing power from what looks like nothing, what moves beyond chance or habit in its great whorls and streams. What preacher in his oaken fort could hope to speak so craftily, so truly of the power of the sizzle and shame, the buzz and hum and emptiness spinning in the heart of things? What nun or priest or worship singer could chant or sing so precisely and so well of the secret messenger, the vast and complicated wind, the wind without border or end, the wind that is ghost and spirit and breath, the in-breath and out-breath of the being more real and tenuous than dark matter, than strings or quarks or whatever particles, spins, sparkling bits of almost nothing, make the heart of the real. The spirit, the wind, the breath. And yes, what can sing like the long blunt blades of the wind machine, the blades that cut nothing but the wind and know the wind flows back together, always smoother than any water. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Jeff. So much. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I'd like to transition. Thank you, Jeff, and thanks for being with us tonight. Uh, the next poet is from Yellow Springs, Anne Randolph has long been an advocate for land preservation, volunteering with Tecumseh Land Trust, as well as the Ark of Appalachia down in Southwest Ohio. She lives next to a wildflower meadow and a backyard wild strip, both of which are beautiful, where she daily enjoys nature's gifts, which inspire her poetry, that has been published by such fine journals as Snowy Egret, Tiny Seeds, Cloud Bank, and many others. Anne Randolph. Thank you, Ed. On behalf of all the Solstice Poets, I want to thank Ed for his 10 years of serving as a host, organizer, and promoter of the Winter Solstice Poetry Reading. Ed has helped make this event the popular success it has become, and we owe him a bundle of gratitude. Thank you, Ed. My first poem, is the giving glen. This sacred ground carved by a glacier, logged, built upon, dammed, and excavated, now bubbles with healing waters over orange rocks, whispers wing beats of rushing migratory birds, dazzles in shows of spring wildflowers, wasps, pine scents, lifts boatloads of cares downstream, breathing hope into the lost. In this evolving living kaleidoscope, beavers return, build an earthen dam with branches, 
create a large wetland welcoming salamanders, turtles, toads, frogs, and fish, feeding grounds for herons and hawks. Gifted this richness, we rewild ourselves as we walk, pause, gaze, and bathe in wonder. My second poem is called After a March Flood. My daughter and I hike an uncrowded river trail, still damp, but dry enough to traverse. Mats of leaves are caught in bare shrubs. Like oversized baseball mitts or giant hands, they wave at us. Splashes of hepatica sprout in blues and pinks as white water roars rushing to the Ohio. Around a bend, we enjoy calm blue-green water. A rattling call breaks the peace as a belted kingfisher zooms upriver. We have disturbed his foraging. Other kingfishers and nearby trees sound distress calls. We quickly turn and flee the floodplain. As rain begins, we search the hillside for limestone stairs. Vision blurred, we stumble over tree roots and rocks. The path seems endless as we trudge past honeysuckle and thorny branches of multiflora rose. Finally, a lifeline of ancient steps. We climb to a perch overlooking churning water. Like a blessing, snow trillions bloom from brown up. White flowers, deep green leaves, the shape of hearts. Thank you so much, Anne, and thank you for- I have one more poem, I'm sorry, I have one more poem. Oh, I'm sorry, thought you were finished. Nope, <laughs> here's my last poem. It's titled, I am waiting. I am waiting for a promised land where we pledge allegiance to the forests, rivers, and plastic-free shining seas, seeking compassion and unity with all living things. I am waiting for drivers to break for butterflies to count each monarch a blessing, little orange kites of innocence flying to the sky side of the road on a fine September morning. I am waiting for bumblebees to be called humblebees again. They're humming and singing as we lightly stroke their soft, bristly backs. I am waiting for children to leave their computers and begin wandering wild and shoeless on green grass, the earth's energy flowing through their feet. I am waiting for beach walkers and shell collectors to honor and give space to dancing white ibises feeding in Florida ocean foam. I am waiting for the Amazonian rainforest to be recognized as lungs of the earth, more valuable left standing, its oxygen blowing north, whipping fresh breezes, faces of flowers, your hair. Thank you. Thanks again, Ann, and I'm glad you weren't finished. <laughs> All right, Matt, take it. Outstanding. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, I'll take a deep breath there for a moment. Uh, I'm waiting too, Ann. Uh, next up is Erica Monto Paulson, lifelong Ohioan who draws inspiration for her work in the fertile fields of her home state. Um, her latest checkbook, Hunger, has been published by Finishing Line Press, and you will find the link to that in the chat. Without further ado, Erica, it's all yours. Thank you. Um, so it's so good to share in this sacred space of poetry with all of you this evening. Um, I've been thinking about tonight's theme of sacred ground and I've chosen these two short poems. Um, I wanted to start with a poem that was influenced by the small town where I'm from in Northwest Ohio. And that very simple and humble sacred space made me in every way. And I really do believe that we are created in our mother's wombs by the apples she takes into her body and the air she breathes and the water she drinks. And that one day uh, in some far off distant space, we will return to those apples and that eternity of air. So this poem is called From the Throat of Crows. She circled the date she would wrap her car around a tree in blue eyeliner on her wall calendar, a question mark scrawled inside the box. 
Everyone was talking at the funeral about how she knew her day was coming. The closed casket and the people in her hometown who preferred to think of lesser things. Her mother recalled how she could feel the storms coming as a child, counting the miles between lightning and thunder until they shortened into rain. Summers, she plucked the exoskeletons of cicadas off the elms to peer through the spaces they left behind. Where great old barns buckle at the knees, fields receive what is left of the living into cathedrals of cirrus clouds and corn. Milkweed seeds engorged within the shell remind where we will suckle from the earth again. On that clear summer day, her body spirited through the windshield like she had broken free and came to rest beside the collapsing rafters of an old calving barn, her breath fluttering into the wind like a butterfly, her laughter emerging from the throat of crows. And this next poem um, was inspired by a time um, actually when my youngest child was learning to speak and I was fascinated by this process of how he would point to things and I would name them for him. And to him, it was just a sound that he was learning to recognize for things like bird and tree and grass. And he would parrot those sounds back to me. And that would become the words he would use to identify those sad things for the rest of his life, which to me, I think is just amazing. But um, there are always those things that you just can't find the words for. And so this poem is called The Naming of Things. A repetition of sound becomes the utterance that becomes a word for a red feathered creature my baby has discovered in a fir tree where it sits inside the branches shrouded with pine needles and snow. Bird. I say aloud when he points his little finger at what quietly observes him from within the tree. Bird, I say again, crouching down beside him, mesmerized at the way his blue eyes pull everything in while the red bird holds his gaze within the branches. We must name these things for each other. The wild creatures called love, need, loss, I will tell you what it is called when you see your red heart flitting in front of you on the branches and how your eyes will sparkle even as it flies away. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Erica. Back to you, Ed. Thank you too, Erica. It was just wonderful, really appreciate it. Our next poet is uh, also from Yellow Springs, and she's a freshman at Case Western University, a Bahamian American. She's well known locally as having been a youth organizer for Black Lives Matter movement here in Yellow Springs during the summer of 2020 and 2021, when an organization now. Yellow Springs Speaking Up for Justice hosted 25 successful back-to-back -back rallies and marches. I was proud to march behind you, Arielle Johnson. <laughs> Hello, thank you so much. All right, I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, so I just have one poem for tonight um, called Sacred Ground. <clears throat> to remember how to run barefoot and calloused through this fruitful land, sharing existence with the cascades leaves and all that life be. Now a new sapling, I am ready to follow thee. I will remember how to find the path through the wind, to feel again the dew drops that rest upon the hair on my arms. I will go where the drums beat in sync with the heart throb in my breast. From deep in my lungs, I chant and charm the bright star so she may rest. I will feel again the clay that swells underneath my heels with every stride. To reconcile with the land from noon to noon as each day waxes and wanes away, staring up and between the tree limbs rushes the golden beams that seem to split the sky's bright blue seams. 
I will reconcile with the land as I lie beneath the sycamores. To return to you who holds the wisdom of the water, I wish to taste the breeze on my tongue like sweet rain, to gain knowledge of the medicines that soothe my gentle frame. I will return to the river and sip on the rippled reflections of the moon. To respect this space in my body, I align my spine with the sound of the soil. Atop earth's clay, I steady my breath and close my eyes. Sweet birds, I yearn to fly with you, and through the storms, I will keep thee dry. I will respect and honor you who soars between the earth and heavens. To relearn, to listen to the caretakers of this land and hear their sacred truths. My black and brown people who I acknowledge and show reverence to. Soon I must realize, reflect, and come back to you. I will relearn how to service the soil and show gratitude for the nourishment it brings. This is sacred ground. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Ariel. I was muted. Uh, you've done so much for our community of Old Springs, and now you are doing stuff for the poetic community. Thank you. And Matt, we're back to you. Outstanding. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, everyone. We're, we're rounding the corner. We've got three outstanding readers left. Next up is Deborah Williamson, a um, professor at Edison State Community College for nearly a dozen years. Um, her prior life before moving to Yellow Springs, including working in New York City and the financial services sector. So um, poetry, poetry brings everyone together. It, it doesn't matter what the background, what our backgrounds are, everyone. So I'm um, really to have, uh, really happy to have you here, Deborah. You are up. So this poem is about the um, shoe shine man on the Staten Island Ferry, and it's called Staten Island Shoe Shine. I hear him before I see him, the shoe shine man on the Staten Island Ferry. Shine, he bellows, competing for souls with the Bible-thumping woman who strolls the rolls of wooden pews. He calls out again, then pauses to catch his breath, drops his case near my feet. He reads the signs of want. Nearby, a folded newspaper drops. My braceleted wrist jangles. Shine, he asks, kneeling at my feet. Five bucks and I make your shoe shine. I nod, scoot back in the pew, a willing supplicant in need of transformation. He blackens the soles first, lifts my left foot, a feather on his scale of justice. He pulls magic from hidden drawers, daubs polish on thick at the toes, then glides the darkness to hide the truth. His sleight of hand snaps forth a thin white cloth, he buffs a two-handed shine on my left foot and Lady Liberty lights my view. My finished foot floats to the floor. The other receives the same grace. Thank you and five dollars pass between us, silent as light, and he rises to shine. And my second one is about um, an experience I had scuba diving. Uh, off Long Island Sound called Diving into the Present. The water is 38 degrees off Long Island Sound. Drizzling sleet and rain batter us as we come on board, stow gear below and get underway. Waves over three feet swell, toss us off balance, our muscles tense in a rigid rush, longing to hold tight in open water. Below the light, below the deck, Gray light filters across rows of plywood bunks, dark and flat, no switch to turn on the light. I take off my clothes, squirm into rubber skin. My stomach and the ocean are in sync. I am churning, the only woman on board. A dozen men are topside, shirtless satyrs sliding half clad in wetsuits emptying their stomachs into the sea. The boat slows, tugs to stop at the anchor's drop. My body burns, squeezed into rubber skin, 
yearns for coolness. The circle of my face breathes, exposed outside my mask. We slosh and sway across the deck, belching, seasick to hoist and strap air on our backs. Our flippered feet slap aft for the backflip into the deep. Once in the water, I am released into the cool expanse of birth, waiting for my diving twin's signal to sink. Murky filtered light engulfs me and umber shadows trail my descent. We float downward, my stomach's churning gone into the dwindling light of the thermocline, the layer between the ocean skin and darkness beneath. A biting chill hits my feet first. My body drops, drops, drops through sepia clouds of squirming jellyfish. A slurry of pulsating, feeding tentacles, floating, reaching, touching my face, my hands, my legs. I cannot claw my way out. I sink into the quiet sea of panic, tentacles, pulsing orbs feeding. I am unable to discern, orient, compare, grab on, escape. Their silent pink and filmy whites distract me like swaying trees. They have their own language. They float. I breathe in deep, exhale, fall below, nothing to grasp. This is the place of letting go. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deborah. Passing them back to you, Ed. Thanks, Matt. Moving right along, we're on the final stretch. Joining us from Columbus, Ohio, is Paula J. Lambert. Uh, Paula has authored several collections of poetry, including The Ghost of Every Feathered Thing, forthcoming from Future Cycle Press, and How to See the World from Bottom Dog Press, which was a finalist for the 2021 Ohayana Library Book Awards. When you look for Paula on the internet, be sure to use the J in her name to avoid confusing her with other Paula Lamberts. Paula, it's all yours. Thanks, Ed. I'll be reading two poems from How to See the World. And the first is called The Breath You're Holding. The man who invented the first reliable mass produced ventilator was named Forest Bird. I cried when I learned this. My father, the first person I ever saw on a vent was also the first I ever saw die. It would be wrong to say a bird couldn't save him. Once walking in the woods, he let loose his trademark whistle. A mockingbird sang it straight back. My father was transformed. I was witness to the sound. I never saw the bird that day, but when I listen, I can always hear dad. It can't be coincidence that Forest Bird was an aviator, that he piloted planes when they started to fly so high that humans could no longer breathe. Bird paid attention. He listened to his own calling. Both these things are true. There are not enough vents, there are not enough birds. But when I stand in the forest and listen, every song drifting back is my father and me. Every call is your dad and you. The wind in the trees is the same as each cry that ever leapt from our throats. So let's try this. Breathe in deep and slow, lift your arms out wide. Believe in a bird that can save us. Let the breath you're holding go. And the next is called Flower Moon. <laughs> Headed to bed late again. How it is I lose track of time when the house goes dark is something I can't explain. I slip past my sleeping husband and into the bath, starting to, startled to see a light left on where we've never had light before. 
The sink, it turns out, the perfect round chipped porcelain sink had captured the moonlight so it glowed. Spielberg-esque, I decided, stepping back to see that the moon, high and round and perfect herself, was shining straight down into the basin. And she was trying, and she was shining straight back up. Tell me there are no miracles. Tell me moonlight can't speak. That something as simple as this sink can't sing a fine aria to what I saw so clearly in that moment had inspired her very existence. Tell me the world doesn't glow with miracles. I'll tell you this, last night was not my first trip to Nirvana. Still, I was reluctant to be there again, but that tunnel of light streaming through the bath, once I saw it for what it was, charged the air so that even as I returned to the fully dark bedroom, the air itself shimmered with a light so beautiful, it woke my husband who reached out thinking it was me. He rose up, placed his open mouth on a hip bone I didn't know still rose through this flesh. I'm not the girl I was once when lying flat, my belly formed a basin of its own waiting to be filled. Light begets light and recognizes love, which rises to to meet it. Anything we've ever named is nameless. Each charged particle knows itself only as part of every other one. That's what light is and love, energy, life force, holy existence, meta, matter, atman, ya baby, ma, me, you, the moon in that sink. How love gives way to making love, whether it should, is mystery itself. But my husband slept beside me while I remembered stories of monks walking at night under the moon, circling a field saying prayers for us all. It makes sense now that monks and mystics retreat, cave, convent, desert, abbey. This is a painful place. Sanguine grace, blood of the sword, knowledge of all that was not, is not necessary. One need not suffer to see the moon, to know it shines on every body of water, empty, full, waiting. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Remember that you are dust, we're told, and so we are. To dust you shall return, it's true. This is a sacred promise. Soil and stardust are both the same. They saw each other last night, sang a song that woke the man in my bed. And who is he but every man who's ever broken my heart? Who am I but one who knows how to heal him, you, me? Who am I but the moon and the basin, the one who sees, the one who sings back? Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Paula. That was, that was a wonderful, wonderful reading. All right, before I introduce the last reader, I want to let you know that we're going to put in the link in the chat, um, a link to the donation for this event. So please, um, if you're able to donate to our cause, um, the proceeds will go to both Tecumseh Land Trust and Glen Helm Association. And our last reader, I'm super grateful just to be able to announce, um, is our Solstice Poetry Reading host since 2012, a West Virginia native. Ed Davis is retired from teaching full time um, at Sinclair Writing or Sinclair Community College in Dayton, Ohio. Widely published, he lives with his wife in Yellow Springs, where he bikes, hikes, and meditates religiously. Proud to call him my friend, and grateful for him to be reading for us and wrapping things up on our tenth annual so Solstice Poetry Reading. Ed. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks so much, Matt. Uh, I wasn't going to read tonight, but Anne Randolph talked me into it. <laughs> and I hope I have enough voice left after Paula slayed me with her readings. Uh, first, these two poems um, are pandemic poems. And the first one 
is about a thing that happened to me in late March of 2020 on the streets of Yellow Springs, which is also sacred ground to me. It's called Phantom Sax Man. His sound greets me two blocks away, too irregular not to be live, it's loud. A busker, I think, though it's only mid-March, rushing the season in our too touristy town. Across the street to avoid several non-maskers in front of Tom's Market, shielding my eyes from the setting sun, the music man has to be a Presbyterian church, but so far, he is only sound until he comes into view at last, standing far back in the shadows of the portico, wailing away, using the stone church like a big bowl from which to send his sweet soul, growling down steps to curl between cars, halting me in front of Sunrise Cafe. Silver slinky soprano elides to low bassy rumble, hooting up the scale. My winter sodden heart gongs in reply. This phantom saxer isn't playing for money. No tips to be found in this ghost town today. And he surely isn't doing it for fame. Love then? As I walk on, his sound fades to a trace. I recall purple and gold crocuses glimpsed earlier. Like the sax man's song, spring's first breaths of resurrection following a year of so much death. Um, my next poem takes me to very sacred ground in the Glen. Uh, the Glen, Glen Helen had to close early March and um, wound up being closed for six months. Didn't know it then when uh, this happened, when we went to the Mother's Day annual bird count in the Glen in May. It had been six weeks, which already seemed like an eternity since I had been on my sacred space. It's called On the Trail of the Rose-Breasted Grosbeak. On our way to Baldwin's Pond, we cross frosted grass, passing through patches of sunlight that don't quite warm. Then we glimpse our bird, pinkish breast, blackish crest, but no, she says, it's something else. Keep your mind wide open and your bird eye peeled. We haven't seen this sweet place for 60 days, a record for me who tramps here 300 days a year. They say it's the coldest ever for the annual count. Our lucky day. Pandemic stay at home order means we're the only people here. The voices joining ours belong to Vireos, warblers, and wrens. Deeper we go without even possibility of meeting a species besides avian, habitation beyond vegetation, sculpture less natural than mossy stone. I'm forest showering now, faucet wide open while light glitters down, cleansing me of even the memory of disease. Turquoise buntings flit. Finches zip, cowbird dries its wings in sun, fat veery thrush preens above. But where is the phantom grosbeak, wonder bird I once watched, gap jawed at my front porch feeder? Will it come again to bless me here at Mother Glenn's breast? Alas, it was not to be this day, but it's okay, for to seek is forever to find. I've seen and heard enough to see me through many lean seasons. Every bird will sing in my dreams and every tree greener than the greenest spring will stay right where I left it the day the world changed. Well, thank you folks. Thank you poets, a wonderful audience. Poetry and land preservation. Thanks everybody. Really appreciate your time and consideration. Good night, everybody. Happy holidays.